the examiners and the supervisor. You probably might know one another here, but for the sake of those who are following so that we know who is here. Okay, I start with, uh, with the supervisor, Professor Michael Masanza here on my right. He currently works as associate professor and he's formerly acting deputy vice chancellor academic affairs, Uganda Christian University. Having earlier been dean of the faculty of science and technology for six years. Professor Masanza does research in ecology, crop diversity, seed systems, entomology, indigenous knowledge, and climate smart agriculture. His most recent uh, publication is Performance of Solanum Ethiopicum Shum Root Accessions Under Repetitive Drought Stress. You are most welcome, Professor Masanza. Thank you. I'd like to welcome, in a particular way, also Professor Yazid Bamtaze from Makerere University. He's an external examiner. He holds a PhD in geography, a Master of Science in Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation, a Master of Arts in Geography, and a BA in Geography. He is working at Makerere University and he is an associate professor in the Department of Geography, Geoinformatics and Climatic Sciences at Makerere University. He's interested in multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary research covering geomorphic processes, land use, and cover change impacts, geospatial based modeling, climate change adaptation, among others. His research focuses on geomorphology, natural hazards, hazards, soil erosion, and sedimentation. He has 21 years education and research experience in academia at university, having joined the teaching service as a junior fellow at Makerere in 1998. Professor, you're most welcome. Uh, the second external examiner is Professor Susan Bala Batumwebaze. Professor Tumwebaze is with us online. Professor Tumwebaze, you're most welcome to this defense. Professor Tumwebaze holds a Bachelor of Science in Forestry from Makerere University, Master of Science from the University of Reading in the United Kingdom, and a PhD in Quantitative Methods in Natural Resource Sciences and Management from the State University of New York in the United States. She is involved in both international and national research collaboration in the areas of biomass equations and estimation, climate change modeling, carbon sequestration in agroforestry systems and post-harvest losses in fruits and vegetables. She has conducted short training workshops in scientific data management in African universities supported by the forum. Professor Tumwebaze is involved in career guidance and mentoring of secondary school students. She has over 17 publications and has attended a number of international conferences. Once again, Professor Tumwebaze, most welcome to Uganda Matters University and in a special way to this doctoral defense. Thank you. Welcome also Dr. Joseph Sekande from the Faculty of Agriculture Uganda Matters University. You are home, but we also want to say welcome to this defense. Dr. Joseph Sekande is a senior lecturer of agriculture extension at Kabari University also. 
He is involved in research on the production and management of fragile ecosystems in Eastern Africa. His training and research focused on extending models and innovations that encourage uptake of innovations to conserve endangered ecological resources and climate change adaptation. He holds a PhD in drylands resources management from the University of Nairobi. Dr. Sekandi also holds a postgraduate diploma in teaching and learning in higher institutions of learning from Uganda Matters University here. He holds a Master of Science in Environment and Development from the University of Reading, United Kingdom, and a Bachelor of Ethics and Development Studies from Uganda Matters University. Dr. Second, most welcome to this uh, doctoral defense. My, my duty is, is very simple. It's, it's to welcome you all and, and wish you a very uh, fruitful and academically engaging exchange uh, with Mr. Enipo Augustine, the doctoral candidate uh, this morning. I would like now to hand the floor to the Dean of the School of Postgraduate Studies and Research, Dr. Elizabeth Namaze. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter Safari. Mr. Gustin and Nipu, you are most welcome to this panel. I would like to congratulate you for having arrived at this milestone. And uh, I would like to invite you to present before this panel your work. We give you 30 minutes presentation. You are most welcome. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As has already been said, um, I'm here to defend my PhD thesis on the research topic, community managed disaster risk reduction through sustainable land management in flood prone communities of Tororo and Butaleja districts of Uganda. This study was in a way necessitated by what is happening um, Uh, like I said, the study was necessitated by what we are observing uh, globally, but also uh, here in Uganda as a, a country, the increasing frequency and intensity of climate accentuated phenomena such as floods and droughts. And uh, we know that there have been quite significant impacts, especially in that decade, 2006 to 2015, I uh, picked out that decade because this was the decade that the international community had uh, made kind of uh, commitments to reduce disaster losses uh, in countries and communities around the world. But during that decade, 224 million people were directly affected by disasters with economic losses amounting to over $130 billion. So it's like despite the efforts by the international community, disaster, disasters remain a major challenge. In Africa, floods alone account for 27% of all disasters. And in Uganda, floods 
are consistently one of the top two uh, disasters that the country has experienced over the past 30 years, the other being uh, drought. And during that period, 2006 to 2015, more than 1,200 people were killed and over 4 million affected in one way or the other. And in Eastern Uganda, the region where this study was situated, 50% of the entire landscape can be considered flood prone. There are varying perspectives regarding the origins of disasters. And these pers perspectives are important because then they will determine or influence what people do to reduce their disaster risks. Largely, there are about four schools of thought. Some think disasters are acts of God. Others think these are acts of nature, while still others think these are joint effects of interactions between nature and society. And then there are also views that think that uh, disasters are purely a social or human construction. So this is very important because it helps in determining the kind of action or whether indeed people can take action for disaster risk reduction. And following from that, there is now emergence of social vulnerability, vulnerability research field, which is um, increasingly focusing on the social side of disasters. In other words, trying to look at the role of humans in disaster risk reduction. And so this model or approach that I used for this study, that is the community managed disaster risk reduction approach, falls within the social vulnerability research discipline and uh, emphasizes community action for disaster risk reduction. And it's also in line with our own thinking, especially as a country, when you look at our policy frameworks, especially the National Policy for Disaster Preparedness and Management, it really places communities at the center of risk reduction with the government and other stakeholders playing a supportive role. So in terms of the problem that I was seeking to address, Tororo and Butaleja districts are really known for frequent flood hazards, but the problem has been that there have been very limited attempts to systematically measure or quantify and document uh, flood hazards and sometimes the flood disasters that hit the region from time to time. And we know also that the occupation of the fragile ecosystem continues, both in terms of um, people having uh, homes there, including in places very near to the swamps or riverbanks, but also deriving their livelihoods from the ecosystem and especially the cultivation of rice. At one time, a whole sub-county that is Mazamasa sub-county in Butaleja district, the uplands had virtually been abandoned for the swamps. So there was a pool, uh, some pool factors that were taking people to the swamps uh, for rice cultivation. When you look at literature, there's a lot known about coping mechanisms of uh, communities. But uh, coping really comes after the fact. And for me, my interest is what are people doing or what can they do before they can reach that situation of having to cope after the flood hazard has turned into a flood disaster. So that was the interest of this study. And so I wanted to investigate their capacities to proactively anticipate flood hazards and to use those capacities to prevent hazards from turning into disasters. It also emerges that external support, normally in flood situations, takes the nature of emergency response. But as we know, emergency response is often more costly, is always inadequate. And uh, we want to see a situation where we can minimize emergency uh, response by having people being able to reduce their risks of uh, disasters. In other words, keeping floods in a manageable level of hazards 
and minimizing the chances of a flood hazard turning into a flood disaster. Then also, there's a little bit of uh, uh, skewedness, I would say, in terms of research itself. When you look at what has been done in the field of social vulnerability research, there's a lot of work that has happened in uh, especially the highland ecosystem, like, uh, for example, the Bugishu um, highland ecosystem compared to uh, the low lands of Butaleja and Tororo, which were um, the site for this investigation. And this is not helped by the fact that um, floods tend to be less spectacular. They are mostly extensive in nature, meaning that they can easily um, escape attention compared to more spectacular occurrences, for example, like mudslides. So yeah, there was also that element, that knowledge gap that I was trying to fill in terms of the context specific uh, nature of vulnerability. And this led, led me to these four research questions. I really wanted to see how the communities were demonstrating awareness, first of all, of the flood disaster risks uh, that were in the context, uh, I mean, in the ecosystem and if indeed they were aware at all. And then what are they doing within their means to reduce their risks to disasters? And this is first and foremost using their own internal capacities. Then the third one question I had was that what uh, external opportunities are available to them um, to bring their internal initiatives to the landscape level? because sustainable disaster risk reduction outcomes can realistically be attained at the landscape level and should not just be isolated or limited to households or villages. Then the fourth question was really about re-examining the social vulnerability theory itself, how best it can be applied for sustainable disaster risk reduction at the community level. Because when I was reading about social vulnerability, we're being invited to examine this a little further and see how it can be contextualized to different um, situations. And so this led me to my study objectives, the overall one being to assess the capacities of the communities to reduce their risks to floods proactively. And uh, the specific objectives, the first the one was I was looking at their level of awareness. How, to what extent are they aware? Then the second one, what is happening? What are they doing in terms of the sustainable land management practices that they have put in place? And I call that endogenous action. Then I also looked at the external environment, what opportunities are available to them to strengthen their own efforts and to bring disaster risk reduction to scale. Then the fourth one was really a theoretical objective. How can we, uh, just to see how uh, social vulnerability theory can be contextualized in the context of floods uh, and flood disaster risk reduction uh, in Butaleja and Toro districts. It's my considered view that this study comes at a very opportune time when we are addressing one of the greatest development challenges of our time, that is climate change and then the associated phenomena such as floods. And so in this study, I propose based on empirical evidence, practical community-led solutions to disaster risk reduction in fragile ecosystems or contexts, and also bringing back to the table the whole issue around balancing uh, land use, environmental uh, conservation, disaster risk management in fragile contexts. Then there I've put in bracket this uh, issue of sustainable use versus no use. I was just reflecting and saying that it's practically impossible to relocate entire communities. Much as the landscape is flood prone, how can they continue to exist there? In any case, they have been there for generations. So sustainable use versus no use. I think this study provides some insights into that. 
Then also yeah, proposing yeah. a complementary model, not just to continue growing theory in social vulnerability, but also how it can be practically applied for risk reduction. So in terms of the theoretical framework, um, I reviewed a number of models. First one being the sustainable livelihoods framework, which looks at capacities. So that guided me in uh, my investigation. Then the pressure and release model, which attempts to trace root causes of vulnerability, and then the uh, dynamic pressures and unsafe conditions that translate um, hazards such as floods into disasters and how that can be uh, mitigated. I also looked at the onion framework, which provides a more holistic view of vulnerability analysis from the social, economic, and environmental spheres. But then I included the BBC framework because it brings out the interaction among the uh, environmental elements a lot better than the, does the onion framework. Otherwise, the two are quite similar. Then the last one is the Yogo framework for action which was uh, put in place in 2005. That's why I was referring to that decade, 2006 to 2015, because that was the time countries committed to reducing uh, disaster losses in countries and communities. So I thought it was interesting and important to review um, the yoga framework for action, the greater areas there, oh, and the good thing they had even suggested um, practical actions that could be customized to countries. Then a little bit just to go back, why emphasis on community? Why emphasis on the community managed disaster risk reduction? And uh, here we are saying that hazards always occur. Floods always hit the ecosystem, but hazards are not necessarily uh, disasters. A flood hazard can be there, but as to whether it may, remains as a hazard, what turns into a disaster will depend on community capacity. So capacity is really a very critical thing. So communities, depending on their capacities, can actually be able to prevent hazards from turning into uh, disaster risks. I mean disasters by reducing the disaster risks. And uh, when I, capacity here, I was looking at three critical elements. As I've already indicated my objectives, their awareness uh, of the context, then the endogenous action they are taking place to reduce their risks, and then what exogenous support they are tapping into. So for me, that ability of vulnerable communities to get support to seek and make use of support from the external environment was itself a capacity. Now this methodology, um, uh, regarding methodology, I begin by giving my ontologi ontological and epistemological grounds for the study. And uh, it is premised in the relativist ontology where I'm looking at multiple realities that you know reality is always being uh, continually constructed. And then from the epistemological point of view, me as a researcher, I provide interpretative input in order to derive meaning from uh, the perspectives that are given. And so when you look at my study, it's all about um, looking at the perspectives that were given and then providing interpretative input. I employed a historical and long longitudinal designs for this. The study goes back to 2010, but actual data collection started in uh, 2014. So for the period 2010 to 2013, I used a, a historical design, and then I employed a long, longitudinal design from 2014, uh, when I started the actual data collection and interfacing uh, with the communities. I used a mixed methods approach involving both quantitative and qualitative methods. Quantitative really just to assess um, the magnitude of the disaster effects, and also to kind of establish relationship between capacities and the level of risks. Their awareness, is it helping them to reduce risk? Their endogenous action, is it helping them to reduce their risk? And as well as the exogenous support. Then I dive deeper using the qualitative methods to get more in-depth information using key informant interviews, 
and focus group discussions. The study was conducted in 10 sub-counties, six in Tororo and four in um, Italeja, and then one parish in each sub-county, and then one village selected in each parish. In total, 382 individuals participated, 236 through responding to self-administered questionnaire, and then 146 in the qualitative study. So this is the summary of my findings. Regarding awareness, I looked at four areas, the awareness of existence of flood risks, the predictability, then the associated factors, what factors are they associating with flood disasters, and then the effects of floods. So those are the four areas I looked at. Regarding existence, there's a very, very high uh, level of awareness. For example, 92% of the questionnaire respondents indicated that flood risks really exist in the ecosystem. Similarly, in the focus group discussions, nine out of 10 of uh, the focus group participants indicated the same and all their key informants. In terms of predictability, it was realized that flood, flood disasters or hazards are highly unpredictable. And they find statements like they can occur anytime or no one just knows when they can occur. Uh, it was only in the um, uh, key informant interviews with some of the district officials where you could get more categorical information like they take almost two to three year cycles, but two to five years, you can expect them to occur. But bottom line, they remain really unpredictable. There are a number of associated factors were identified. I've just picked a few here, and such as exposure to dangerous locations. They talk of declining soil fertility as a push factor, sending people to, 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 to the swamps poor infrastructure, especially bridges, which cannot hold water. And so um, the, the, the bridges burst and flooding occurs, localized flooding occurs. Then also the coping mechanisms at household level, and then the limited participation of communities in the disaster risk reduction in general. Then in terms of effects, this was a very key finding for me personally. Um, flood effects were reported to be mostly severe and catastrophic. And these are the highest levels when you do measurements on uh, uh, the hazard and uh, risk instrument that are used. So the problem is huge and uh, the effects were severe and catastrophic for most of the years of the study, especially from 2010 to 2014. It was only in 2015 that things kind of eased a little bit. But then also, uh, got information about some intangible effects that are normally not seen. They are not seen in the public domain. What do people go through in times of a flood, for example? So the phenomenology interviews that I conducted were mainly meant to get those uh, inner experiences and to see how they influence people's action. And so issues of trauma and fear uh, were reported among others. Under objective two, what are the communities doing within their means? There are quite many, but uh, I picked out this example because I thought it was fundamental. In the ecosystem, you find talk of dodging the floods. People talk about it quite a lot. And that means they plant almost any time of the year. In, when they see rain, they plant. That crop that I, I put there, that uh, millet crop, I took that picture in March. And normally March is not a harvest uh, month in the ecosystem. Millet is normally harvested around May and June. But this one, because of that timely planting, you can see that it's possible for communities actually to dodge the floods like they say. And you can even see this, it had started flooding, but I think for this one managed to, to escape that. And you'll see a lot of such efforts, but isolated here and there. Then I put that graph there uh, from the, uh, the self-administered questionnaire. It almost speaks to uh, that picture as well. Sometime back, we knew that there were two distinct seasons in the ecosystem. Maybe you are talking of March to May or June rains, and then you are talking about October or September to November rains. But now it's becoming less distinct you'll find that people are actually planting anytime. So it's like there's a season now called planting anytime and it is uh, 
yeah, growing in the ecosystem. These are some of the other efforts that the communities are trying to put in place. Drainage channels. I, I put that picture there. That is actually a bridge connecting two sub counties. You know, it's so in a, that sense, it's a strategic bridge. If Paul were to go all around to go through a, a, a well built bridge, it would be very, very difficult for them because they would have to travel long distances. So they have done that within their own means, and it's a very busy bridge. People keep crossing from one sub county to the other. And um, actually, they challenged me to do the same, but I, I couldn't. I thought it was really a bit dangerous. So I put that picture there to show what other efforts people have in place. It goes for drainage channels. It goes for all other community initiatives. But I think this kind of thing cannot bring about um, landscape uh, level outcomes. Then I also want to make a comment on migration. Um, migration is one of the ways that people could actually employ to get themselves out of harm's way. In the ecosystem, it's not really a, a popular thing. But they are saying if it's migration temporarily, locate and within the ecosystem, made to higher ground, that one is okay. But to go outside the ecosystem, there's a big challenge there. Emotional attachment to land and so on. And also that one ties to, you know, leaving the land to rest. They are saying that many years ago, people would migrate as a strategy to leave the land to, to, to rejuvenate. But these days you cannot guarantee that because of population pressure and so on. When you move away, you'll find the land has it's still being cultivated in a way. So briefly, that was for objective two. And then for objective three, what opportunities exist in the external environment? A number were mentioned, not very many, but critical ones. They talked about early warning information, especially from the ministry, sorry, from the Department of Meteorology, where they get uh, regular advisories about when to plant, about uh, how to prepare themselves. Then they talk about the machine at Namulo. Um, that picture there shows um, an early warning system that has been installed at the bank of river Manafa. It's supposed to monitor the flood levels and to alert communities of impending danger. So at the time it was installed, it was said that was the first of its kind in Africa. So, and the communities embraced it. Unfortunately, when I went back two years later, it was not functioning. And I got interested now to understand why. And I found there was a lot of myth already attached to it. You know, it brings floods, according to them. When the siren goes off, floods come. But of course, now that was actually to maybe uh, attest that it works. Um, and then many others, which I may not say here. So it was really, it pained my heart a bit that this state of the art facility um, kind of uh, went into disuse. And actually, they even now vandalized the solar panels. So it was, somebody went now, they took it maybe for personal benefit at the expense of the entire community. There are also opportunities in the, uh, uh, working with NGOs and the private sector, I don't know much. In my explanations, I found that what is there like, uh, I mean, reported as partnerships are not really partnerships, but more of service delivery and more of top down. Then also there are programs that offer potential for mainstreaming uh, to what the communities are doing. So what are my overall conclusions from this? Regarding objective one, I'm saying there's a high level of community awareness. It's really there, but I think there's a little bit of disconnect between what they are aware of and what they are doing. And so you'll find that communities indigenous action, which is objective two, is kind of localized and ad hoc. And like I say, that one cannot really bring about uh, landscape level outcomes. Then those opportunities, like we've just seen with the machine at Namulo, they exist, but not really optimally used. And yeah, like I said, what is there as partnerships is not really when you look at the partnership principles, it's not that empowering uh, arrangement where you know you work with the communities, and then at one point, you leave the communities to, to, to manage on their own. 
Uh, and that leads me to the issue of community participation, which is an important element of community managed disaster risk reduction model. It happens, but at the very basic level, mostly involving giving information and then consultation. You don't find a lot about joint decision making. You don't find a lot about uh, joint initiatives and then also supporting communities uh, initiatives. But I'm saying that there's potential really to grow these models, uh, to contextualize them so that they can bring the outcomes. In other words, moving them from paper to the ground, that potential exists. So briefly in terms of implications, I'm really sorry I can't move that, so you'll not be able to see, but that is implications for theory that I put there. I'm proposing that, humbly proposing that simple model, but I think the thinking behind it is the need for more contextualization of social vulnerability models, and especially building disaster risk reduction efforts on endogenous action. There's now talk of building resilience from the inside to the outside, or uh, building from the local to the global, and not the other way around. So I think that is a big implication uh, from my perspective. In terms of policy, we have excellent policies as a country. I'm personally really proud of them. We need to support communities to ensure that yeah, those policies that they are, are operationalized. National policy for disaster preparedness and management itself is an excellent document. It needs to be popularized and people need to be aware of them because you'll find that not everybody actually, even among technocrats, are not necessarily aware of what those policies entail. Uh, also, policy discussions around regulating wetland use while availing alternative livelihood options. We need to bring back to the table conversation on conservation agriculture, biodiversity management, agroecology, and so on. Then mainstreaming is important. There are a lot of programs out there, but they will need, we need to mainstream properly. Sometimes, like one of the key informants said, things get lost in the mainstream. How can they be in the mainstream, but we can still see them there? In terms of practice, that awareness, communities need to be supported to translate it into practice or action. And then identify best practices that exist. I'll shortly be sharing one model, which I think can uh, give inspiration. And then as we give exogenous support, it should really be based as much as possible, be based on endogenous action. And then strengthening community organization uh, to effectively participate so that we can realize landscape level outcomes. So this one of the initiatives that I felt provides a very good example. There's a farmer called Haji Naleba in uh, Utaleja. He's uh, an excellent rice farmer. But what he's doing is to mobilize community. And this is in that sub-county, uh, sub which I said at one time, the uplands have been abandoned for the swamps. So what Naleba has done is to organize rice farmers into an association. He has 11,000 members. And he has actually managed to remove them from you know, that ad hoc activity that they were doing in the swamps to now doing rice cultivation in a highly organized manner with drainage channels, properly laid out infrastructure, and so on. So that those kinds of initiatives, not many, but they are there. So we need to look out for them and uh, support them. And also, yeah, just treat them as demonstrations which others can learn from. In terms of methodology, I have a few implications there. Um, one of them is the geographical scope of this study. Um, I realized that the root causes of some of the uh, of vulnerability in the ecosystem, some of these causes are beyond Tororo and Vitaleja districts. Sometimes it originates from the highland locations. And so, yeah, of course I couldn't, my study could not go beyond um, the study site of the history of Also the historical design, this involved uh, reconstructing experiences from way back as 2010, for example, in 2014 or 15, and there could have been a few challenges the here and there. And then also the verbatim capture and transmission of voices, especially 
getting the meanings. Like I said, I was only providing it. Some scientists do include the separate products in the short run. Hello. I proposed a few areas here for further research for consideration. Do you hear us? I did a little bit of phenomenology interviewing. Yes. And honestly, what came out of there, I think merits further investigation. You, yes. There's a lot that happens in people that we do not know. When a flood occurs, we give them support. And normally that's how it ends. But what have people learned from their experience? And how can those, how can those um, uh, experiences be used to influence action? Hello. So studies around, most studies around that probably would be helpful. And then also evaluating DRR in multiple ecosystems. I know we've talked here about floods, we need to talk about mudslides, we need to talk about droughts in a holistic manner. So for example, we can have a study of the Manafa, the whole Manafa catchment system, all the way from the mountains up to the lowlands. Can we have such studies? Or we can have a study on the Lake Victoria, Lake Choga catchment system. What are the potentialities there? And then when I was doing this research, I, I think I mentioned this, or oh, I'm winding up, sorry. Um, when I was doing this, it kind of raised uh, expectations. People expected a project. So I think there is need for action research also. When you have come up with this kind of information, how can, then how can the communities be supported to implement in form of action research? Thank you very much for listening to me. And I want to extend my appreciation to all those listed, to the panel, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. The audience that is um, listening in, thank you so much. Of course, my supervisors, as has already been said, thank you so much. I'm so indebted for the way you have worked with me in this journey, and I appreciate the university, uh, the school, sorry, typo there, School of Postgraduate Studies, the faculty, thank you so much. And above all, the people, of Tororo and Butaleja districts who accepted me to undertake this study and give valuable information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For this comprehensive thank you for this comprehensive presentation. Uh, without wasting time, I would like to invite Professor Yazid to come forward with his questions. Professor Yazid. Much appreciated. Um, I welcome the opportunity to interact with the students, but also broadly for being here in this uh, beautiful campus. Um, Chair, this is an interesting field of study, broadly speaking. And I have some quite some experience in this field. I'm saying that for purposes of requesting you to time me and cut me when the time is right so that I don't appear disrespectful to the other members who have to, to ask. I realize the candidate has a great passion generally for the field or in the field of disaster risk uh, management. So that, that's quite, uh, quite good. And when I read the thesis, I also realized that uh, these somehow emerged, emerged into those specific districts where the study uh, was done from. So that was quite interesting in the sense of 
knowing the science, the research vis-a-vis -vis the knowledge that the candidate already has um, with respect to that. But this is a, an academic meeting. So I will ask you some questions related to that, uh, some theoretical questions and, and maybe questions to do with your, your findings. Your work raises a lot of issues from my point of view. Uh, some of them you have explained and we are also interacting with colleagues here in the morning. So we have this issue of a hazard versus a disaster. And generally speaking, I you want to believe that you worked on flood hazards or flood hazard. What's a flood if we can start from there? Yeah, a flood um, can be a collection, an unusual volume of water collected in this particular place that is beyond the current capacity of that location. You use the word can be, which means there are alternatives to what you have presented, or do you think that's the absolute? It, it, should, it could be absolute, but um, also given that conversation, hazard and flood. So if it is, becomes beyond the capacity of the, uh, the system to carry, it becomes disaster. But if it's within, then it will just remain as a hazard. Okay, we wanted to start with uh, a, a, just a flood, but if you are pointing me in that direction, we can engage slowly. So conceptually, you have that definition, right? Of the flood, let me use the word flood hazard. And maybe the phrase or term flood disaster. Practically in the fields and in your area where you did the study. When can you objectively say that right now we are dealing with a flood hazard? Mm. And at this point, we are dealing with a flood disaster. You've worked from there for long. Maybe you come from there. I don't want to speak <laughs> no, I uh, got the feeling that you are familiar with, with the area. Yeah. So we, we need to move it from your knowledge of the area into this conceptual as well as yeah. practical. Yeah, you yeah. tell me if, if it's not clear, it's an no, easy clear, but yeah. if I can ask it from a different way, yeah. has there ever been a flood disaster in Italia or Tororo? Yes, Professor, actually that's what my study finds out. That's why I said I began by quantifying the problem. And uh, for most of the years of the study from 2010 to 2014, they reported that the flood events were either severe or catastrophic. So that's already the flood disaster. 2015, they were moderate, but still the next score was severe. So you say maybe the flood events is a little bit, not the same level of intensity, but still quite a number of severe incidents that were reported. So for sure, if you ask me, and that was also the purpose of this study, we really don't sometimes take the time to quantify so that we come to that fundamental question. Is it a, a disaster or is always a hazard uh, in the community? But this has found out that it mostly flood events turn into flood disasters. By just saying it is severe or catastrophic, does that mean it is a disaster? Are those the parameters or those are just perceptive categories? If you are in the fields, how do you objectively say that we are now dealing with a, a flood disaster and not just a hazard? Okay. Because uh, you, you, as I say, that was part of my quantitative assessment. So I used the um, hazard and risk assessment instrument developed by the University of California. And it's normally used for assessing uh, those events. And um, so the scale ranges from zero to five. And um, any level from, I mean, beyond three, that is four to five, categorizes that event as a disaster. 
it can be a severe occurrence or it can be it can be a catastrophic occurrence. Then ha having got that broad picture, I now went to interrogate. If, uh, you, if you allow for purposes of time, I have understood maybe we can move on. Um okay. A little bit related to that, we get floods in Talija and Tororo. Yeah. We also get floods on the other side of the country in Kasese. I'm, from, I'm, I'm sure since you have worked on this field, yeah. you have that based understanding. In Talija and Tororo, these are flood plains geographically. Yeah. If you look at the landscape, yeah. it's flat. Yeah. So floods are not abnormal. They are normal and they have been there since historical. Yeah. And the communities you are talking about have evolved in that environment. So it cannot be a shocker, in my opinion. It's part and parcel of that culture and that system. The question I want to ask, because the livelihoods of the people in that area is largely premised on flooding. If the floods are not there, the rice is not grown and it's going to be a big problem. Yeah. So, and it's diff a different story when you compare to Kasese, because there you have this high flow of water and it is yeah. coming rapidly and it can be shocking. So do you take floods to be really a problem in that area, more of a problem or it's more of an opportunity and, and the communities appreciate it and therefore there shouldn't be cause for alarm because their lives are dependent on that. Just a short answer. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a problem. So it's a problem, first of all, the important it is. And uh, also, now they themselves are dealing with proposed alternatives. They think that it's not really worth okay? Rice is not worth anything. And that's why the Nalepa model, which I use, is now bringing them from the, um, from the swamps so that they can engage in rice, preferably upland rice production, but also engage in other languages. So they are now in two other library options as well. But they really appreciate that as a problem. Okay, but uh, for the record, we don't have people who have died from floods in that area, do we? Yes, sir, we have. When? Uh, actually, I put in my, there's some reports that came through in the, in, um, in the newspapers. Some people died, not so many. Okay. Uh, people die. And also what I've realized is that sometimes, you know, they don't bring out everything to the public. People die, but actually I was told of the story where that bridge there, not particularly that one, but some people die when they try to cross. Okay. That road, yeah. Okay, fine. Um, you built your problem from the way you explained that there is lack of quantitative data and measurements mm. uh, pertaining to floods in this area. Mm. And you also postulated that most studies have been done in the mountains, mountain Oregon, indicating a poster of studies mm. in this area, although I couldn't see that being indicated. Do you think flood issues in Taleja and Tororo uh, and in situ in place? Yes. You, you understand in situ? In, situ yeah. in, in place or in situ? Is it an in situ issue or we should tackle it from the point of view of what happens in Mountain Oregon? Because scientifically speaking, um the incoming rainfall in the area may contribute not more than five percent of what you get there and the rest is coming from from from, from the top 
I am tired of going to do the testing. And that's why in my areas for further research, I was saying we need a study that covers, for example, the whole Manapo catchment area. Let's begin all the way from Bududa up to Medu River and probably down here. But um, as we do that, what can we do in our needs? The communities have to do something. And that was my interest. What are they doing? Because again, in my right, I was saying, you know, the countries are saying they are surviving. I look interested in that. What do they mean by surviving? So they really have to do something. And uh, as I agree, it needs that kind of broad landscape. Level. So do you say you tackled a wrong area in terms of understanding floods? That if you had gone to the mountains, you would have unread, unraveled. And, and, and in your talk, you are using the word root causes. Yeah. You would have understood that the root causes are not in Utalegia or Tororo, but rather in, in Manafa. And therefore, if you studied Manafa, you would have understood the flag. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fine, fine. Um, the next question partly linked to what I stated earlier, the issue of quantification. You use the word quantification as the premise for your study, uh, but I couldn't see what you quantified apart from these categorical issues of severe or not severe. And here we are talking about a process which is natural. If a flood can be empirically, derived. And so if you have not quantified to say the flood was this much, how do you come to the conclusion that really there was a catastrophic flood? What have you quantified? Yeah, I guess that would be another level of analysis, Professor. I was looking at the definitions. When they say catastrophic, what does it mean? Catastrophic means um, the effects of the flood are so severe that the communities are not able to handle even with external resources. So I go out with that simple question. Were you able to handle? Was the district able to handle? They were not. So I will conclude that, yeah, that is a catastrophic one. But I think what you are suggesting is really another level, which I really take. Yeah. Okay. You point out presented quite a number of theories. You swing from theories, you go to models, maybe you can talk about laws. It's not a problem for me because I have uh, an understanding of what it is. In any case, I appreciated the way you were writing about these things, what you present under your ontological or epistemological underpinnings and the like. What would you pick as the sort of intellectual clashes between these theories and models you present or contestations that drove your study or your thoughts to be unraveled with this sort of a, a case study or localized? I, are you in a very brief way to give me some of, or give us some of those contestations or gaps? Yeah, I can. Within this? Yeah. I can try. I'm going back first of all to the origins of the causes. That's very briefly. Because yeah. I'm, I'm, there are contestations um, between the social value the theory and, mm -hmm. for example, looking at disasters as an act of God or as purely an act of nature. So they are already, to me, I feel there is a bit of contestation there. Of course, then that means people have no role to play in this. Um, but uh, I'm kind of in line with the other theories, which talk of the interaction between uh, the social system and the natural system. Because there are Pardon? Which theory? Which theory? That's give you that balance. Now that is now in the BBC framework and the Onion framework. The Onion framework gives a more holistic analysis from the social, economic, and what they call it, this integrity uh, 
sphere. So it mentions environmental uh, aspects a bit, but yeah, they are there. So I included the PDC framework because we have to narrow get a complete picture. We are able to analyze the social system, the economic system, and then the environmental system. So they are not, in your perspective, not contestations or cuts of frictions. Yes. What I'm thinking from you is you are aligning yourself to the BBC and, and, and Onion. But what I was looking for is clarity and say, this is not very clear in this or the other, or whatever, and then inspired me to, to investigate further on the ground. Is there any? Yeah, I actually made a mention of them. Um, for example, I say that each of the theories has a little bit of gaps, but it's kind of complemented by the other theory. For example, when you look at the pressure and release model, it's an excellent model for tracing root causes, but it doesn't, doesn't emphasize the environmental aspect. And yet, humans are continually interacting with the environment. Then when you come to the BBC framework, um, it over, there's a tendency to overemphasize the environmental, but it doesn't look so much at the social sphere. Okay. You use the terms or the words ecosystem, you use landscape, you use community. Do these mean the same? What, what, what's the landscape? in the way you are looking at it, and then what is an ecosystem, and how do these fit within your area? This is something that runs through your thesis. It's also something that runs through your presentation. Yeah. But when I look at now the practical or operational way of looking at this in the context of your work as presented, and as it is in the book, one could argue that they are used in, in a vague way. And I'm used, one could argue in the, in, in, um, in the sense that it's not clear to us whom you are speaking to, either verbally here or in your book. Thank you, Professor. You're right, it's possible that there could have been a inter change of words here and there. But uh, basically when uh, looking at the community, I was looking at the social system. For example, if I interact with um, the people in the county, in the parish, in the village, that's a community. Um, when I talk about the landscape, I look at the physical area, which is almost close to the ecosystem. We are talking about the land, we are talking about the soil, the vegetation, and so on. And our ecosystem again now combines, kind of brings all together, it's more holistic. So what did you tackle in your, in, in your study? Because even the people are living on their physical setting. It's really been a, a study premised on sort of an energy field, which allowed of the, of the theory. What, what did you tackle? Because you have to draw conclusions based on a coherence of your family, your graphical context, and the yeah. issues. So I tackle the community. Defined in terms of people. Yeah, and, and the, the way they manage their environment. So, okay. Um, you raise some issues. Uh, First of all, you indicated that you are aligning yourself more to the social vulnerability of research, yes or no? Mm -hmm. If that is the case, then broadly speaking, that is in uh, opposition to the natural vulnerability or vulnerability point of uh, not natural, the hazard yes. perspective, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Do you think in disaster risk management, we have um, sort of a binary choice, whether we have to go for the social vulnerability, sometimes people call it political ecology, yeah. or 
the natural hazard. Is that binary? Does it have to be a binary choice? Yeah. And you let me know if you are not understanding the <laughs> question. I'm just finding this difficult to have a dichotomy that you know, this is either this falls because, like I say, um, floods are natural hazards. So that one I really appreciate. But what can the social system do to manage that hazard, natural hazard, uh, before it plants into a disaster? So a flood, I do recognize a flood hazard. Those are natural hazards. Which brings me to the issue of capacities, as you indicated in your study or in your findings. Are we able to adduce and understand people's capacities without interrogating their incomes, their source of livelihoods, and the like? Is it, is it possible? To empirically say, I understand the capacities of these people, and therefore I can make judgments. No, it will not be holistic. The picture will not be complete. But uh, when I was looking at the effects, I took income into consideration. So I was looking at how are floods affecting people who are in the same category, those who are more. And then also in terms of infrastructure, if you have permanent houses and so on. So I think that makes sense. Well, your, your research instrument here does not indicate that you captured that data. So that's why I'm asking. When I interrogate your research information, you don't collect that data from the households. And therefore, I wonder how now you are able to say that these people have capacities or they don't have capacities. Also bearing in mind our convergence all here, including you that yeah. we can only say it's a disaster on the basis of the capacities of people. It doesn't matter whether the flood is as big as what occurred during Noah's time. Yes. If we have amassed the technology and the capacities and now we can handle it today, then it's not a disaster. So what happened? Why didn't you pick out this important data? No, just a little puzzle. Maybe I do You don't know, okay. You, no, you look at it later. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't, okay. Yeah. yeah, like I said, please feel free to tell me uh, that's the end. I have, I have three minutes. At the global level, and you speak about the period between 2005 and 2015. Yes. In your words, you think or you argue that that is the most important phase in terms of looking at disasters from the global point of view. I'm sure you are familiar with the Hugo framework of your actions. And then you are also familiar with the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. One can argue that that's not the most important phase because the Hugo framework of actions do not have any binding commitments from the government, but rather just a stipulation of some issues. So why do you think that's the most important and not the post-2015 that brings out the you know, global development agenda that includes the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction 2015, yes. 2030? Yes. And maybe we can start from there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I actually review both. I review both frameworks, but I thought the global framework was really interesting because countries committed to it that we shall reduce uh, disaster risk by 2015 and both at country and also local level. So that was interesting. It really fell naturally well into my study. And of course, the Sendai was just building on the global and so forth. In your findings, 
you also presented this annual, what do you call it? Uh, you're presenting one of the graphs, the, the trend uh, from January to December, and you talk about planting dates mm -hmm. and when floods are occurring. Mm -hmm. Then you say the predictability doesn't exist or is this Marello? That's what I understood from yes. you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. yes, okay. But at the same time, you're saying people are coping by planting early. Isn't that a contradiction? Yes, it really looks like it. But uh, when I asked Father, they said, uh, we're just gambling. <laughs> so it works out, but it's a gamble. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Like um, that crop actually could get wiped out. So it's more of anticipating the problem anytime. So it's more of an anticipatory capacity that they are doing. So how do you draw a conclusion based on a gamble? Yeah, that's their own rules. That's the way they but of course I provide a different interpretation. Okay. When I talked about my epistemological grounds, I say they they give their their reality and then I provide interpretation because now what that means is that the system is adapting. It's adapting, which is very good for them, not as they think it's a grant of reality. Okay, two small things there. Of course, one is a methodological issue. I'm sure you are familiar with triangulation yes. issues. Yeah. The concern was what you have said. You have an opportunity to either confirm or dispel whether what they are telling you is correct or to go further. The concern now is you're drawing a strong conclusion or maybe a wrong premise, but slightly connected to that, I also don't see how you generated that temporal trend because your data, your research instrument does not have a question that required the respondents to give you that temporal data. So where is this coming from, Augustine? It is, it's there, actually. I think, I, like I was saying, on the, at least what is appended on, on the thesis here. I'm very sorry, I think the problem of touching uh, about this problem. Other those findings actually I started presenting them even in our PhD seminars here. So I think now we just got to lose this time. Okay. Uh, the then maybe a last one for now. I think time is, 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 is running. So it may come back later if need be, but you are alluding to policy related issues in your work, which is anywhere required. You want to see issues of policy emerging. You talk about uh, the policy. I don't know if it's a policy issue. You said we have very nice policies yeah. in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Then you talk about uh, mainstreaming. Yeah. I couldn't see. Uh, Anywhere in your work where you interrogated whether there is mainstreaming or not. And then lastly, you also make a proposition, the model you have suggested. When I look at it, I don't see where the tenets you have that in that model is premised on the results you got from your, your study. Uh, it, it seems to be a conceptual model you have developed, but without being informed by results or data uh, from from the study, uh, Augustine. Yes, okay. I think it's informed because I still in that model I talk about capacity, really what I'm doing as action. This comes all the way from the objectives. And um, so I'm kind of proposing that let's look at what is happening, deal with on that, and then also build their capacity to seek external. So it's quite consistent with the objective. Yeah, I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much. It's made the reasons it can raise the other interesting.
Thank you very much, Professor Yazid, for that wonderful interface with the candidate. Mm, I would like now to call on Professor Susan to engage with the candidate. Professor Susan, you are welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, the candidate, Mr. Augustine, for the presentation. I hope my voice is clear. And I, re I request Augustine to move near the laptop so that I can hear his voice clearly. Okay. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to be part of the panel for Mr. Augustine's PhD defense. Uh, from the presentation, Mr. Augustine, uh, probably I can put on my video so that you can see me. Uh, from the presentation, you seem to have deliberated any literature that was reviewed to support your problem or even your discussion. Can you, Augustine, tell us a reason why you deliberately left out literature to support your problem? Uh, sorry, Professor, I, I missed the first bit of the question. Is that in relation to the presentation? Yes. Yeah, I think I just had a bit of time constraint trying to time myself. But other from the literature, I picked out um, the theoretical models, those five models, and then also gave um, that background on the origin of disasters. Okay. Uh, from your methodology, Augustine, you said you started your data collection in 2010 and then started your longitudinal study between 2014 and 2015. Yes, Professor. Can you explain why you decided to divide your data collection into two, yet this is one study? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, initially, I thought this was all a longitudinal study. But then, like I said, I started actual data collection in 2014, and yet I was going back to 2010. So it was like um, the period 2010 to 2013 was not really falling within um, a longitudinal kind of design. So that period when I was not actively collecting data fitted better as a historical design. And then from 2014, when I now went to the field, I started lo the longitudinal study from there because I would go to the field every season, I think covered about six seasons. So that makes it a longitudinal study. Okay, uh, Augustine, in your presentation, you showed that your sample size was three, 382. And the questionnaires were 236. The rest was qualitative. In your thesis, you show that your sample size was 299. That is page 72. And then the, the, the sample size changes to 20, 217, page 75. Can you explain why? Page 72. Yeah, you just go to where your sample size is. The one you've presented is 300. Yes, yeah. yeah. 82, where our questionnaires are 236 and the rest yes. is qualitative. But now what you wrote was you had a sample size of 299, which then changed to 217. Yes. So the 299 is um, the calculated sample size. But not all those questionnaires came back. 
the 236 came back. So I based the findings on the 236 that came back. I also noted the problem of the 219 because that was based on um, uh, a report because I kept writing this report, but I received more questionnaires actually as I, uh, when I'd already started analysis. So I apologize, that was just purely a typo. Okay. Uh, can you explain, can you actually define what equal probability sampling is? And you have uh, written literature to support that type of method that you used in your sampling? Yes, Professor. I actually got it from literature. And um, it was basically a simple way to do it because um, you'll find that in a sub county, there may be just six parishes or even fewer. So that one, I just got a list of sub counties assigned and parishes and villages, assigned them names, and then I did the selection. Once you select from uh, the list, you don't put that selection back so that you give equal opportunity for the rest of the sub counties or parishes to be actually not sub counties because those were purposely selected. So, yeah, the parishes. So, you don't put back what you have a parish you have selected from the pool. So, that, that's exactly what it means. Okay, Augustine. So, which unit, what was your sampling unit? Yeah, I did a purposive sampling of the sub counties. We looked at the most at risk sub counties. Then from there, sampled one parish and then sampled um, a village from the parish. Because the village really is the unit, <laughs> as they say, where vulnerability occurs. So that was the lowest unit of my so sampling. Your unit of sampling was the village. Yes. So does it mean that you had 299 villages? No. 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 Um, okay, the 299 was for the quantitative aspect of the study, where I sent out questionnaires for the quantitative aspect. So that was for the quantitative element. But then to now identify the um, the people to meet, I went up to the village level. So the focus groups, for example, I conducted were based at village level. Um, the phenomenology interviews I conducted were based at village level. But then the questionnaire survey uh, was based at the district level. At district level. So were you yes. giving the questionnaires to households or to the districts? Yeah, they were varied. There were those that were given to the districts. There were those that were given at sub county level as well. And also depending on their positions, because some of them, for example, were members of the disaster management committee. So yeah, they were, they were also targeted. So then uh, Augustine, where did you introduce the equal probability sampling at district level? There's a bit of confusion as to what your sampling unit is and what you are actually basing on to analyze your data. Is it the district, the community, the village, the household? You're telling me you gave, gave out questionnaires. Yes. And you got 217. So are those from households, villages, or parishes? Yeah, some. Uh, actually, the questionnaires were distributed at all levels. A few could have also gone to the village because of yeah, of the nature of responsibilities that the people hold, but not many. Most of the questionnaires were distributed at district and then at sub-county levels. Now, the equal probability sampling method was used to identify uh, the parishes and the villages to participate in the study. Otherwise, for sub-counties, I did um, purposive sampling. Because when you look at the flood maps, uh, those sub-counties are known. The 
the flood prone, most flood prone sub counties are known from the district data. But now when it came to parishes, any parish within that sub county could qualify for this study because the flood map ends at the sub county level. So that's where now the equal probability sampling method comes in to get out the, sub, uh, the parishes and the villages. Okay, uh, Augustine, you talked of using mixed methods. I don't yes, know whether Professor. this is your research design. And then within this mixed method, you're talking of qualitative and quantitative. But then you're saying your, your work is mostly based on the interpretive paradigm, which is largely qualitative. So where do you leave the quantitative part of your work? Yeah, I also thought maybe um, the quantitative aspects also benefit from interpretation. That's the, how I was looking at it. And even when you get quantitative data, it needs to be subjected to interpretation in order to mediate those meanings. So you didn't have quantitative data. Augustine, did you have quantitative data? Yes, I had. Which type of data did you have? Pardon? What type of data did you have? You can just give me one example. For example, um, uh, I had to determine the level of flood disaster effects, the magnitude of disaster effects. So I used the quantitative data to do that okay. using the yes. HRI instrument. Okay, so you got that data. And I'm going to ask you another question, which is more of methodology. I didn't see in your thesis where you really analyze the quantitative data. Mostly what I saw are tables and graphs. So from your thinking, what statistical test would you subject your quantitative data to show us whether there are differences is either in, in floods yeah. over the years and also districts. Thank you. Thank you. It was the way I presented it. Otherwise, I have my SPSS output, which probably I should have included in the appendix. I use the Spearman's raw correlation coefficient, uh, I mean, test to um, determine communities' capacities and the level of disaster risk. So using the data from the HRAI instrument, I will now correlate that against the level of risk that the community suffered or experienced. Sorry, effects, not risk. And so from there, uh, I was able to see whether those capacities are actually reducing the community's level of disaster risk. And from the analysis, it emerged that none of those capacities was actually significantly reducing the community's risks. But I have all the SSP, uh, SPSS outputs. So among the two districts, Tororo and Butaleja, which one has higher disaster over those years? It is uh, Butaleja, but that is more based on the, um, I did run a statistical test to compare the two because it was not okay, really, sure. it was not a priority for, for this study, but when you look at the qualitative data, you can see that it's more perceived in Butaleja than in Toro district. Augustine, you said you used mixed method design. What is mixed method design? It is both quantitative and qualitative. So do you mean the quantitative part was not necessary for your thesis? No, that's not what I mean. I yes, was that's what you just said. Of comparing the effects in Tororo and Butaleja. I didn't run a statistical test for that particular bit. I did, but uh, that one I can always do. Okay, this is a comment for you to consider afterwards. If, okay. if when, when I read your thesis, I realized there was a disconnect between qualitative and quantitative data. Yet you're supposed to triangulate your results. So, 
Do you want to base on qualitative to make your conclusions for your thesis or you want to, you have to make a decision on which of the two you want to eliminate from your study so that your study flows? Okay. Professor, I was, uh, think, I was thinking that would, I would still use both the quantitative and qualitative methods and maybe just okay. try to report a little bit more but uh, when you look at yeah. the thesis, really, I try to do that. Maybe not done uh, as ex to the level expected, but I would suggest uh, to just a beef, maybe the quantitative aspect. Augustine, now this comes to the layout of the thesis. In a discussion, what are we supposed to do in a discussion when we are writing a thesis? Now we yes. are supposed to discuss our findings and also that is the opportunity to interact with the literature. Yes. Um, what was the, the relevance? Uh, yeah, you've already answered. What was the relevance of scope of study, research design, data integrity and researcher research relationship under discussion? What was the relevance in your thesis? Why did you have to present that? Sorry, maybe I'm not here. Uh, can you just repeat it a bit? Um, I'm, I'm fine. I want to find out the relevance under your discussion section. Yes. What was the relevance of scope of study, research design, data integrity, and research related relationship under the discussion section? Yeah, I thought it was just to. Uh, re-emphasize what had already been reported earlier but i agree probably it is something that is <laughs> kind of repetitive and not necessary professor will be able to change yes. that yes yeah you see you've realized that you you had already reported it and there was no need for you to present it under the discussion again i also you, want professor. to advise you to when you are in a discussion section you're supposed to have reviewed literature from other scholars and support your discussion section. Most of your parts in your discussion, in your thesis, lack citation. Was that also lack of time? Oh, it was just a, a typo. Now I've taken note, it should really be like that. I will just do more of that, I appreciate. When it comes to conclusions, and recommendation. That section, it's like you are again writing another discussion. Augustine, conclusions are supposed to be clear and straightforward. Summaries of your work, you already know them. Actually, you don't even need to look at what you did before you write a conclusion, you just write the conclusion. So from your thesis, what was your main conclusion that you think contributes new information to the science to the body of knowledge yeah um i can put it this way going by the objectives i can conclude that people are aware of the risk in the uh, that they face in the ecosystem and that they are actually trying to do something to reduce their risks there are also some opportunities available but uh, these are not being optimized. And so those efforts that are kind of localized, endogenous action of the communities will need to be supported and brought up to scale if we are to achieve more sustainable disaster risk reduction outcomes at the landscape level. So that's how I would conclude. Because I was looking at capacities, yes, their capacity in terms of awareness is high, capacity to take action internally there, but maybe not so high. And then their capacity to, to seek external support and to make use of it also needs uh, quite a bit of strengthening. It's only if that is done that we can say there will be more realistic uh, disaster risk reduction outcomes in the ecosystem. Okay, for now I stop there, uh, director. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Susan.
that wonderful interface. Uh, allow me to invite Dr. Sekandi to engage with the candidate. that if I go beyond the regulatory time, I get one such that you don't go on and on. I want to start from a thinking process or a discovery process before you start conducting this research. And I ask, uh, really quickly what direction this work wanted to take. Probably you can later on inform me whether it actually took that direction. Uh, in my reading on the faces, it's either wanted to take a discovery process to understand the issues around this, somewhere it goes on an evaluation process uh, to see which uh, models or which uh, practices are working, but also from a social vulnerability analysis, it uh, also wants to take an intervention process. Uh, I don't know whether you took all these intentional and maybe if you didn't take them intention, or which one did you want to go far deeper? Maybe all my questions can be informed by that. If you first let me know on that. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it was more of a discovery at the onset. But then also I was aware that there are initiatives out there that probably needed to be tested to see whether they are working. So a little bit of our evaluation. Then in the recommendations, you find that some kind of um, interventions are good. But of course, also when I was interacting with the community, um, and okay, I have understood you very well. Again, also before I move further deep into what I want to find, I am also not very certain. Uh, on, uh, and I think the professor has really touched this. And for me, if my answer could be in terms of variables uh, that inform me of uh, a flood hazard and a flood disaster, uh, if you could help me, I think the, I get the answer that you gave, but uh, in terms of the variables that perhaps informed this work on when does a, a flood translate from a hazard to a disaster? I don't know whether you can give me a few variables to, to get me started. Okay, um, thank you so much. Okay, first of all, just to go back, I use that instrument, which I administer to people to see the effects, in terms of the effects that we have. And you can uh, press those effect on the scale of zero to five. So then once you have got that kind of quantification, we can use that now to, to, to compare with the actions that they are doing. So those actions compared with the level of risk, we'll be able to tell you that this action is effective. In that place. For example, if when the scale sample say they take all the actions of this reduction, but they still score four or five on the HRAI scale, then you can uh, conclude that that action is not working. This person can reduce it 
Yeah, exactly. So it was basically looking at the HRAI instrument and then using those um, the data obtained from there to correlate the effects of people suffering. Okay, I, I get you around that. For me, what I saw a lot in, a, in your problem statement uh, was that uh, there was a lack of capacity. And I would like that to assume from various literature that the capacity would remove around the ability to predict whether there will be a disaster, but also prepare uh, for that. I, from that, which looked very well to me, I did see it uh, translating into maybe questions uh, to help you discover that stage. Uh, it is much more a lot to do with awareness. I don't know whether that means the same, that if I know that the disaster is going to happen, then I have capacity to deal with it. I, I, I couldn't find that uh, within the, the, the work, but nevertheless, I, I want to leave that at that. I also want to pick out a little bit on the theories, quite a number of them. I don't know whether it's the same experience with my other colleagues, but uh, they all uh, stood out by themselves uh, and they are good theories for that matter. I couldn't see how they were able to be brought down into a section that will be called knowledge gaps later on. But nevertheless, I will just speak out one, uh, the Alstein's ladder of participation, if I can only pick that. So in terms of the ability to predict and to prepare, I wanted to understand from you. So, so when, you know, if I can only pick out uh, the ability to predict, at the lowest end of the ladder or at the start. Mm -hmm. So what do people do in preparation? I like to assume that as they move up the ladder, that the capacity is going on increasing, but at the lowest end, at the bottom of the, the ladder, uh, what do people do? If you want to look out for it, it's around page 23. Mm -hmm. What do people do at that first stage? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, in my review of the literature, I say that Einstein's ladder was kind of modified to bring out the interconnectedness among the several ladders. So you find a modification of that ladder on page 24. It was done by records. But anyway, when we back, we find the lowest level in Iceland's ladder is manipulation, which we really don't, we don't encourage going to happen. Um, even the second uh, level is therapy. Then you'll find that participation the way begins from level three, which is information. But now the challenge is how is, it, how is the information done? Are people seeking information or they are just being informed? Okay. So it would be nice that uh, other informed are also seeking to uptake information because they need they want to use that information to address their problem. So that's why in my part analysis, I actually now zero down on the Wilcox ladder, which is an improvement in a way of um, essence ladder. And so in Wilcox, you find information in the past. So all these things around tokenism and relation. So, but also we are saying information, like I said, should be referred to active search of information to address the problem at hand. And then um, consultation, the other people need to be consulted for sure. But that should now lead to deciding 
I have understood you, uh, understood your answer very well. I want to imagine that uh, by nature of uh, their geographical location and for generations and generations, they are people have lived into these areas over and over again. And uh, for lack of a better word, there has never been a total wipeout. So there has been a capacities to adjust and main to this. Yes. I even at the lowest point of leisure, there must be some abilities. And uh, I wish these abilities had been correlated with the highest end of uh, analysis. And then we can then dispute or qualify uh, publicly held views that uh, as the person gets education, gets uh, more money, mm -hmm. then they are able to adapt. I, I feel maybe that was an opportunity that was missed there, but uh, I can show go that for now. I have also uh, a very smaller one, and I good thing that is Susan on Professor Susan on this panel. I think in a study like this, it's easy to measure uh, it with the to measure capacities alongside socioeconomic factors before than geographical locations. So this area we are in is called Inkozi. There is a next village called Nachivang, another one called Misese. But I want to imagine where I live in terms of a village has lesser to say about my ability to deal with a disaster than maybe my level of education, my, uh, my social networks, my things like that. And I think that's what uh, Professor Susan was alluding to that. But uh, before I go to that, I think I'd like to imagine where this work was carried out. It's a normal community. Uh, when you say a study population, mind you, not a sample population, but a study population mm -hmm. are uh, farmers, members of disaster management committees. It's quite uh, cut out of particular socioeconomic groups. I wonder whether these floods are sometimes selective. So when they come, they would uh, affect some people and they somehow find a way of navigating and leave <laughs> the others around. No, actually. Please, please. Yeah. Yeah, that, it reminds me of one of the focus group discussions that somebody was saying, everyone is affected. No, this was kind of like somebody who didn't believe in um in certain action to care. So even the rich are affected. Like that. So no, they don't navigate for sure. But then the difference comes from the magnitude of the difference. Maybe there's also the more money, there's the better infrastructure. Will not reach that level of severe and catastrophic effects. So, they will always, everyone always interrupts with this one. And that's where the time in two disaster, like you say, will depend on your capacity. Yeah, they are you are the political issues and also maybe conceptual issues that uh, I put a number of comments in here. Uh, but I want to go to the model itself. Uh, uh, I don't know within what I thought, and of course, you're free not to agree with me. Is it perhaps needed to point to necessarily having looked at all these other factors, awareness, the community actions, which, by the way, I think because you need to go into deeper statistical analysis. Uh, they are presented at the very top end, but we can come back to that. 
I thought it should be able to make predictions of what will be maybe temporary measures that at the onset of a flood, uh, what do people do? And you clearly mentioned there is a breakdown on uh, some of these infrastructures like early warning systems. But uh, if there was, uh, I don't know why it didn't appear, uh, within the model, what would actually people do? And perhaps if, uh, I don't know why it wasn't, uh, I, didn't, I can't find the proper word, why it wasn't ranked to inform that for a particular group of people, a particular community, it is safer to start with so-and-so. And I have seen some work done in pastoral communities. I, I made a reference somewhere in my writing, where pastoral communities at the onset, they think about the stalking. I couldn't see in the rice growing communities, what do they do on the onset? Do they uproot it raw? Do they, you get what I mean? The, the second issue that I, again, didn't find out that beyond that, what is the response action or planning to understand that once people, of course, at the onset, there are budgetary issues, there are planning issues. At the onset, you can forgive anyone, any intervention, any delayed intervention, but in a long period, uh, what would this research recommend as a planning? But, you know, I think uh, what, like you mentioned somewhere, people are left uh, by themselves. I don't think you use the word dodge. Yeah, use the word dodge somewhere. So what do they do? And also maybe scaling up issues uh, to do with the, I'm assuming they could be broken down in settlement areas, but mainly in your work, it is mainly fields, uh, livelihood groups. So what happens around there? When should you bring the kosho uh, from Nabanja, like it's probably known <laughs> now, but also when you go to the Ministry of Agriculture providing seed, or when you refer to World Bank to offer this large scale strategic planning? I, I wonder what, why that didn't come in the model, whether it was planned or not. No, Ideas are there, but I think just maybe the question. I couldn't. Yeah, I don't know how much time I have, and uh, I want to return it to the chair for now. Thank you very much, Dr. Sokandi. And Augustine for the responses. Will there be any other round of questions? Yes, Dean. Dean seems to have a question. Thank you, Chair. I thank you, Augustine, for the presentation and the work. It was the effort you put to reach this far. I want to start by looking at your title. You talk about disaster risk reduction. I was wondering how do we reduce the risk of a disaster occurring because the first examiner asked you a question which uh, I think uh, you try to answer it, but I didn't get clear distinction between a hazard and a disaster. 
And so I'm asking you, how do we reduce the risk of a disaster? Okay. Yeah. I, I, thank you so much. I think I get you. And um, yeah, maybe just go back a little. What is the difference? The difference is that um, we we always have hazards interacting with us. For example, a flood when it hits, it's a hazard. But now it depends on the um, conditions that that hazard meets, the capacities of the people, or the levels of vulnerability, potential vulnerability. So as to whether a flood hazard or event comes into a disaster, will depend on the capacity to absorb, absorb that event. Some have low capacities, and most likely that hazard will turn into a disaster, meaning that uh, the affected people are not able to cope using their own resources, and they will need external support. But um, if the capacities are strong, then those absorptive capacities and anticipated capacities will be able to manage that event as a hazard. So it will not turn into a disaster. It will call for extra support from outside. So when it comes to measurements, that's again why you go into these tools, the instruments like the one I used, the hazard and vulnerability risk instruments developed by the University of California, but also Action Aid, Codeid and Czech Republic have also developed uh, vulnerability and capacity assessment tools that can be used to determine the levels of vulnerability. Thank you. Maybe these are just concerns that I want to raise and you may note them for your revision. Because first, I wanted to understand risk as a likelihood is a probability of a disaster happening in the presence of a hazard. That is the risk. And we may mitigate either through adaptation as you focus on capacity, which is adaptation actually, you build the capacity of vulnerable elements. The vulnerable yes. elements could be the communities, could be their property, the crops, and the assets they own. And then also I wanted to, because the way you answered, I remember you gave the example of a few people, cases of some people who died as a result of a flood phenomena in Tororo and Vodaleja. And I was wondering whether any death due to flood qualifies to be a disaster. Because then we ask ourselves the question, what is the difference between a disaster and an accident? So an accident could be a sudden occurrence of an event that results in loss of life or destruction of property or result in injury. But then a disaster captures, I think, three major elements which really distinguishes disaster from an accident. That it may result in loss of life, destruction of property, and loss of source of livelihood. Now, those three elements are the variables. I remember Dr. Second, he asked me a question, what are the variables? And I was not satisfied with, this, with the way you tackled it. In my view, variables that define a disaster are those three. The livelihood should be affected. In which case, it is a flood phenomenon in the rural and good allergy actually results in enhancing source of livelihood in the community other than becoming a distraction to that source of life. So you may emphasize your study, hinge it on the risk reduction, the risk, the probability that that presence of flood may result in a disaster, but the disaster has never been there. 
And that's a major concern. Then the quantification, this has come out very strongly. And I was also wondering whether you presented quantitative data in your study, because I expected to see the different categories of communities. Let me talk a disaster as a function of hazard and vulnerable elements. Then when we come down to the level of vulnerability, vulnerability depends on exposure. And among community population that is exposed, what percentage is susceptible? And what is the coping capacity, which I will call the resilience? So vulnerability is literally a function of the product of exposure and susceptibility relative to resilience. So I wanted to see the quantification that in this population, the percentage that is resilient, percentage that is susceptible. Now that does not come out. And I think that is uh, the emphasis that Professor Susan was placing in when she was asking about the quantitative data which we didn't present. And that left me wondering whether this group is a homogeneous group. So I submit, Chair, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Going back to disaster. Because now what I'm, maybe I didn't understand clearly, it's like maybe there have not been any disaster occurrences. But I'm saying there have been. Because you have to go to that definition. When you look at the United Nations uh, strategy, international strategy, strategy for disaster risk reduction, they define all these terms. What is a hazard? What is a disaster? So in that framework of the UN, a disaster is defined as anything that causes destruction beyond the ability of the communities to, to manage using their own resources. So that is the fundamental, fundamental definition. And then uh, in terms of uh, categorization, is this a homogeneous group? No, not at all. Because uh, like I said, I actually ran some analysis also of the household incomes, for example. Um, but I've taken note that we did, I need to include all of the table, or specifically uh, compare those levels of vulnerabilities, uh, maybe even family size actually, can all be included. There are physical conditions like the housing and all that. I'll do more that in that. But thank you so much for the observations. Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you very much, Augustine. Uh, I noticed that uh, much of your presentation differs from your written. Your presentation, your oral presentation, yeah. is very different from your written process. Yes, there is a lot of work that should have been put differently, probably, in order for people to understand better, I think. The inputs of the panel are big, big eye openers to those areas. And probably many questions arise because of that. So I would like to thank members for your inputs and Gusty, thank you very much for engaging with the panel and for putting in the kind of clarity that probably was lacking in the written. At this point in time, wondering if there is any more question, which I suppose there isn't. 
Professor Susan, might you have any other round of questions? Uh, I have just two. I wanted to find out from Augustine, from his work, can he comfortably now mention that a particular, Augustine, from your work, can you now mention that a particular management system will be able to reduce the risk of that particular community to be affected by the floods? Then the second one, uh, which of the two occurs first? Is it the disaster or the hazard? And lastly, why did you choose Butaleja and Tororo instead of Mountain Elgon or Kasese? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. The first question is, um, is there any single method that can address the problem and I would say no, because even in my recommendations, I front a multidisciplinary approach, given the multifaceted nature of vulnerability. So we have to fight this from all angles. Um, the second question, sorry, I think it has gone, but let me answer the third. The third one, which one comes first? Is it hazard or disaster? A hazard comes first. Actually, hazards occur all the time, but the game changer is the level of capacity. When the capacities are strong, then a the disaster can be, can be avoided. That's why, for example, uh, there's that slogan about Holland, that man, God made man and man made Holland. Holland is really, you would say, potentially vulnerable to flooding from the sea, but they have tamed it because of their capacity. So these hazards interact with the social and uh, physical system all the time, but depending on the capacity, they could or could not translate into a disaster. I'm very sorry I forgot the second question. The, the last one was, why did you choose Butaleja and Tororo instead oh, yes. of Mountain Elgun? Sure. Yeah, I'd made uh, an observation in my presentation that a lot has for some reason, there's quite a lot of work happening in the mountains as compared to the lowlands. And the nature of floods that we experience in this country is that they are mostly extensive. Extensive meaning that they are silent, silent killers. Sometimes they go unnoticed. But the Red Cross one time published a report which says that those extensive silent phenomena are actually the most dangerous. And they were saying up to 80% of their budget goes into managing those silent phenomena. So yeah, I, I felt that there was a positive in knowledge uh, in Butaleja as compared to, to the highland ecosystem nearby. That's the elegant region. Uh, Augustine, I'm sorry, but I wanted you to tell me from your study, socially, from what you received from the community, from what you received from history, how has the community dealt with the disasters and, and the hazards? And uh, from your point of view, from the analysis, what are you adding on? So that now you can take that information to the community of Torora and Butaleja and help them to reduce uh, the risk of disaster and hazard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor. I think there are two things. One of them is the indigenous knowledge systems that the community had accumulated over time. What I gathered from there is that it's no longer valued so much. So there's a breakdown in the indigenous knowledge. But also, given the increasing um, trends of climate-related uh, phenomena, it's becoming more and more challenging to make use of uh, indigenous knowledge to, to reduce disaster risks now. I think the whole context has changed. Uh, disasters are becoming more unpredictable. So in addition to the indigenous knowledge, which is no longer uh, so popular, there is therefore need to support what the communities used to do. Not just to support, but to first of all to revive and then to support that externally. I think that is the message that I would take back.
Thank you. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Professor Susan. Professor Yazid, you seem to have an issue. Uh, time has gone. I'll, I'll just mention. Sometimes when we, it can be quite a challenge to move from to issues and operationalize them in the field. And, and I'm not really the candidate as this theoretical information. Um, but when now, if you just apply that small conceptual model that a disaster, or well, let's say risk, is a function of hazard. Mm -hmm times vulnerability, if you like, from your talk, you can the past in there. Then it's a disaster. Now, I think the point of view and perhaps something that has been rotating among us is to empirically talk about this hazard in its different dimensions. In the absence of you being able to quantify and put some thresholds, it becomes a challenge to just look at the other factor within the equation. And you have a one-time data point you collected your data not as time series data that every year you are able to pick this data pick this data and pick the other data so vulnerability from your point of view even in the way you did it is just a one time and then for the flooding we can also talk about it from that angle but we are lacking the quantification of how big this flood is. I'm not raising difficulties for you, but perhaps if you had collected some data on simple parameters, even rainfall data, because those floods are rainfall driven, then you have an opportunity to see whether it is the hazard which is changing or it is are people becoming more vulnerable or they are becoming more stronger over a period of time and therefore when you compare these two you are in a more sort of a vantage point to make uh, some conclusions uh, with respect uh, to that uh, otherwise uh, it remains a little bit blood mm -hmm. even with uh, uh, you're gaining promises on what you can add if the data is is, a, is missing. You might be promising uh, too much, and maybe that can come in another way. But the other issue is really the scale of analysis, and it has come out in different ways, either from me, Dr. Sekandi, the dean of from Professor uh, Susan Kinevazi. So a single, let's say one family dying from floods, does it constitute a disaster? That's fundamental even in your revision. And who says that it has been a disaster or it hasn't been a disaster now? In other countries, there is a declaration that a disaster has occurred. Then you can have it that it was declared. In our case, it's a bit staggered. I know what happens with, uh, because this can fit in the government system, but at, at your level, perhaps it would have been paramount to ask the communities, when did they ever receive external support and how many received the external support? Then you have some kind of a rough metric where you can say really a disaster occurred. But if you define it in the sense that we are looking at 
disasters happening or declared or us considering them when the capacities have been exceeded, but we are lacking data from you indicating those instances when disasters, when people's capacities were exceeded, then it becomes blood. It sort of just fits within the theoretical definition, but we are lacking that data from your community that can now tell us that in five or 10 years, they did in, indeed they got five disasters out of the hazards which are occurring every day. And that can be important both in the objective, but also understanding whether they are becoming more vulnerable, it is constant, or they are becoming more resilient. Chair, I don't want to raise the presentation, but just a comment uh, to, to sum up from my side. I also want to raise a comment. I want to avoid asking others. I think I've been trying to leave this out. I think if, again, I don't know, again, I doubt whether the data is there, but if it's there, it could be very interesting. And I'm basing my contribution from even all the modifications of the vulnerability frameworks, all modifications, I think they point to two pathways. Uh, below is the management what you would call adjustment, whether people are able to make adjustments to their lives to recover from this. Above of it is a, an impact, it's called impact, but can also be called a drop off, that they are being able to drop down in a bare capacity. It could be very interesting within all these uh, number of uh, findings, whether it is productability in awareness, whether it is within the community, the doji, the, the doji characteristics, whether it's in the early warning systems, to really go a step up and tell us that when a community, a household, whatever unit of measure you want to take, mm -hmm. does has this ability to predict, then they are likely to have an upward curve, they will recover, or they will have a downward curve, they will drop off. And then it is at that point, I think for me, there could be a very interesting recommendation based on this, uh, you would call them best practices from communities because your work is really on community best adaptive capacities. So I think for me, that could have been very interesting. You have all these, uh, and there are quite a number of them, which is good, mm -hmm. but I think they stop at a certain <laughs> stage. You might be interesting. Uh, Professor Susan here is better than me on this, on running. Mm -hmm different models on that that you can do. But I think you would benefit from going slightly if the data is there. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, members of the panel. At this point in time, I would like to request to Augustine to step out. And then we shall call you back. I ask the ICT team to create a breakaway room for us. Thank you.
Era tipo online, tan ansioso por su online. Please do, please do, do. Practically use the opportunity as if I'm hoping.
Transparency is so real, reliability you will feel, accountability is a big deal. Mm. Whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference, we do it for you. Now look where we are, we shine like a star, and we take it over. Making a difference. I am Uganda Matters University in Kwasi. And I am located at the equator. Quality to me is a way of life. And I am celebrating 25 years of excellence in the footsteps of the Uganda Matters. From 1993. To So to you can't do what as you're now, cause you're now. Whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference. We do it for you. Now look where we are, we shine like a star. and wisdom I'm leading the world now look what a wonderful world so wonderful so wonderful it is and cause it to such a move era to live more together we can our quality is slow and real the transparency is so real reliability you will feel accountability is a big deal mm -hmm. We are whatever we do, we make a difference, we do it for you. Now look where we are, we shine like a star, and we take it over. You can die or not older, older, I'm making 25, I'm causing 25, yeah, growing old. Making a difference. I am Uganda Matters University in Kwasi. And I am located at the equator. Quality to me is a way of life. 
and I am celebrating 25 years of excellence in the footsteps of the Uganda Matters. From 1993, Pakaleno, to a day to Chibida, a chibida, a chinene, Omutonzi eva de Tala, Kubaya Mulisetala, the Tula Bewala, Ewala, Ewala, so to gain them on my song. Teddy Kuta Mabeka, you can't matter, so now, Kosi, or now, whoever we are. And wisdom, I'm leading the world. Now look what a wonderful world. So wonderful, so wonderful it is. And cause it to such a move. Era to live move. Together we can. Our quality is slow and real. The transparency is so real. Reliability you will feel. Accountability is a big deal. Mm. Whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference, we do it for you. a difference. I am Uganda Matters University in Kwasi, and I am located at the equator. Quality to me is a way of life, and I am celebrating 25 years of excellence in the footsteps of the Uganda Matters. From 1993, to a day to Fukiri Damiti, Cati Dengeremiti, Emitianito, Chifu se Chibida, a Chibida, a Chinene, Omutonzi Eva de Tala, Kubaya Mulisetala, the Tula Bewala, Ewala, Ewala, so to gain them on my soul. America, you can't do matters, you're not cause you're not whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference, we do it for you. And wisdom, I'm leading the world. Now look what a wonderful world. So wonderful, so wonderful it is. And cause it to such a move. Era to live move. Together we can. Our quality is 
loud and real The transparency is so real Reliability you will feel Accountability is a big deal mm. Whoever we are Whatever we do We make a difference We do it for you Now look where we are We shine like a star And we take it over Uganda you're not Making a difference. I am Uganda Matters University in Kwasi, and I am located at the equator. Quality to me is a way of life, and I am celebrating 25 years of excellence in the footsteps of the Uganda Matters. From 1993. To what to Fukiri Damitio, Cati Renge Miti, Emitianito, Chifu se Chibida, E Chibida, E Chinene, Omutonzi Eva de Tala, Kubaya Mulisetala, E Tula Bewala, E Wala, E Wala, so to gain them also. You can't do matters, you're not cause you're not whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference, we do it for you. Now look where we are, we shine like a star. And wisdom, I'm leading the world. Now, look what a wonderful world! So wonderful, so wonderful it is. And cause it to such a move, era to live more. Together we can. Our quality is slow and real. The transparency is so real. Reliability you will feel. Accountability is a big deal. Mm. Whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference, we do it for you. Now look where we are, we shine like a star. a difference. I am Uganda Matters University in Kwasi, and I am located at the equator. Quality to me is a way of life, and I am celebrating 25 years of excellence in the footsteps of the Uganda Matters. From 1993, to what day to Fukiri Damitio, Cati Renge Miti, Emitianito, Chifu se Chibida, E Chibida, E Chinene, Omutonzi Eva de Tala, Kubaya Mulisetala, E Tula Bewala, E Wala, E Wala, so to gain them 
I am Uganda Matters University in Kozi, and I am located at the equator. Quality to me is a way of life, and I am celebrating 25 years of excellence in the footsteps of the Uganda Matters. From 1993. To a day to Fukiri Damiti, Cati Renge Miti, Emitianito, Chifus, Chibida, E Chibida, E Chinene, Omutonzi, Evade Tala, Kubaya, Mulisetala, the Tula Bewala, Ewala, Ewala, so to gain them also. You can't do matters, you're not cause you're not. Whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference. We do it for you. Now look where we are. We shine like a star. And wisdom, I'm leading the world. Now look what a wonderful world. So wonderful, so wonderful it is. And come see to such a moon. Era to live Together we can. Our quality is low than real. The transparency is so real. Reliability you will feel. Accountability is a big deal. Mm. Whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference, we do it for you. Now look where we are, we shine like a star.
Augustine, you are most welcome back. At this point in time, we notice that you have you have corrections to make, but we shall request you to make according to the policy of Uganda Matters University. When you have corrections to make. Expect you to sit them, sit on them. We we'll give you a period of six months. Some students have been telling me I'm going to ask a leave. It all depends on the student. In this way, continue working with your professor for guidance. And after you have submitted. We shall ask you, Professor Sekandi to verify your work. Otherwise, I'm glad to announce that you pass the right. Congratulations. <laughs> and many thanks to your professor for joining with you. Thank you for the resilience. A PhD is not about intelligence, but it is about tenacity to pull through. Thank you very much. Today you will go with the books. They have they have remarks. We shall also give you the ready reports, and then with the time we shall give you the final report, which you will follow to make the compliance report. Professor Yazid, we are sorry, <laughs> Professor Masala. We are eager to share. I'm sorry. We are eager to share to hear from you how you have journeyed with Augustine over the years. Then, But my my words are not muffled. Uh, the chair in the, in the school of Postgraduate Studies and Research, is Dr. Elizabeth Namazi. Um, the panel, um, ladies and gentlemen, I congratulate Augustine. It has uh, been a long journey. And uh, because of many reasons, it has taken this long. But God does not make mistakes when it comes to some of these things. I was appointed uh, as co supervisor in 2013. And uh, everybody was busy, but we had time to meet. The three of us, we have never met only the two of us, except after the demise of Professor uh, Julius Mwine. I must say that uh, since everybody was a busy person, each one had what we call personal responsibility to do the work. And I commend Augustine for towing the line and uh, doing his part as much as possible. I realize he was a busy man as well, 
Sometimes it was difficult to get a common place and a common time to meet and discuss. But it all started at proposal level. And uh, I think the first interaction was in Kampala. It was in Kampala. And we looked at the proposal, the objectives, and to, to, to sharpen them what they are currently. And I think there are some reports which we sent to the graduate school. I hope they eventually reached. But because it has been a long time, at some point I was asked whether I really sent these reports. And that, that shouldn't be an issue. And now, um, it was unfortunate that Professor Mwine, it is unfortunate that Professor Mwine is not here to hear this testimony. And I'm sure there are some things that I may forget because he could remember, may, could have remembered maybe some of the things. But from the very beginning, we went and visited the study site uh, in Tororo, Tarejia. And we saw what Augustine was talking about when it came to floods and hazards and so on. Now, sometimes, a supervisor may not know a detail of a certain terminology because the field may be different. Supervisors normally look at the objectives, then look at what, of course, they can go a mile longer to discover some of these other things. It may not have been 100%. And uh, I think that a community-based research is the best that can give a feedback and an impact and the relevance to the communities that we see uh, that are being researched with. So I hope that at some point, Augustine will go and visit these communities and give them relevant feedback so that they benefit from it. Myself, I had a PhD study in rural area in Tungama, because some of the work was in labs in the Netherlands and so on. But at some point, I had to go back to the farmers and say, this is what we did here, and this is what happened, and really, this is what can help you. They can take home a message. So we visited a place, and we took even some pictures of some of the coping mechanisms. Uh, I think he had some pictures. Now, Augustine did a lot of work, and you can see the size of the book. One of the comments I made to him was, now this tome, in English, the tome is a very huge book. This tome could be reduced, uh, maybe, but because of the regulation is, you, you have spacing and so on. Now, the university where I was, you just have to write single spacing and on both sides. So that term reduces to a readable booklet. But I know it can still be read. Now, of course, it was very encouraging to me as a person to be on this panel. And it's encouragement to be a supervisor to a PhD student. And uh, it was very gratifying to be on the move where with Professor Mwine, this one we found him on the other side, to look at the landscape and uh, the, the possible hazards and so on, just as the supervisors. And uh, I think that if you are a supervisor and you are not very a friend with a student, you might have very big difficulties, but he's a very friendly person. And I don't know if any of you has ever interacted with him. He's a likable person. So I don't want to talk too much because it's not my day. It is your day. And I must appreciate the panel, all the examiners, and everybody who had an input in bringing this journey to this stage. Thank you very much. And may the good Lord bless you. I hope that those comments that have been made, they are not to Slice, slice your neck, 
but they are supposed to prove you so that you improve your uh, dissertation, your thesis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. She's our senior assistant with Ms. Brown. Thank you very much, Lady Evelyn, who is here with us. I am um, inviting you to a lunch. Probably conclude and we declare this panel closed. Conclude with a prayer for lunch. Much. Thank you for taking us to this event. Thank you for the company. Ask you for your continued guidance and support to be. Make all the corrections that have been presented to be that finally crowns this whole work with this graduation. Now we pray also asking you to bless the meal that we need to share that it can help in our nourishment. Also, the memories we are not sure of what to eat, we take care of them. Also, that is hard to think about this. We make our prayer to Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Members online, thank you so much for being with us and for all the time you put in. The meeting is closed. You're welcome, Director. Bye bye. Meeting is closed. Happy twenty five. Twenty five. Yeah. Making a difference. I am Uganda Matters University in Kwasi, and I am located at the equator. Quality to me is a way of life, and I am celebrating 25 years of excellence in the footsteps of the Uganda Matters. From 1993, Bakaleno, to Bate, so to Whoever we are, whatever we do, we make a difference. We do it for you. Now look where we are. We shine like a star and we take it over. You can die or not. Older, older, making 25. Cause it's 25, yeah. Growing older and stronger, happy 25, Umu 25, yeah. I'm guided with wisdom and leading the world. Now look what a beautiful world. So beautiful, so beautiful to me. In virtue and wisdom, I'm leading the world. Now look what a wonderful world. So wonderful, so wonderful. Such 
chimu era tulibumu together we can our quality is slow and green the transparency is so real reliability you will feel accountability is a big deal mm. whoever we are whatever we do we make a difference we do it for you now look where we are we shine like a star and we take it over you got your Making a difference.